My head hurts. I don't even know why I'm here, or why I'm writing this. I should be somewhere else. I... I should be doing something. But I keep thinking. I keep thinking I should post here. Maybe that would be a good idea. I've always wanted to be a barista. Sure, it's never been an avid dream of mine. I like the fantasies we have as kids. But, well, I don't know. Maybe someone out there dreams to serve coffee for the rest of their life. For me, it wasn't really a fantasy, like being a ballerina or an astronaut. Instead, like many other college students killing themselves to make a decent wage, I needed cash. I needed cash, and I needed it badly. I have always marveled baristas, though. I ordered a coffee at 8am before class and watched a sleep-deprived teenager turn into some kind of artist with whipped cream transforming my macchiato into their canvas, a piece of art worthy of an award. Seriously, what they do has to be magic. At least, that's what I thought. I always wondered how they did it, how they made these drinks without having a mental breakdown. It's the kind of thing I'd always known I'd suck at, but I wanted to try. So I did my research, and by that I mean I went on YouTube and watched barista vlogs. Yes, they exist. I was surprised too. There are hundreds of channels all dedicated to half-hour videos where you get to watch them make weird and wacky drinks. It's kind of therapeutic to watch. When I wasn't in class or sleeping, I was watching these videos to get a basic idea. I knew I couldn't just go in without experience. They would laugh at me. I spent maybe a few weeks researching and writing down all the different kinds of coffee, milkshakes, and smoothies. There were so many combinations, and the pace it was done at made my brain hurt. You might be sitting there thinking making coffee is easy, and it is, when you can memorize an order and know the combinations by heart. After weeks of trying and failing and giving up, and trying again, I handed in my resume to my local Starbucks as well as pretty much every store in walking vicinity. Starbrooks had been my go-to coffee shop all the way through my freshman and junior years of college. I'd watched baristas come and go. I could even name them. Becca, who couldn't use the coffee machine. Jake, who helped her out. Luca, who always gave me extra whipped cream. I wanted to be part of them. They looked like a family behind the counter, laughing and chatting while making coffees and serving customers. I know it's not always like that. We're all human. Life can be a drag and can get in the way. Sometimes they looked tired and their smiles were lesser than. Shadows under their eyes, uh, like they hadn't slept. Like they'd been up all night. Luca wasn't always smiling. Becca wasn't always laughing. They were college kids, and I expected them to have at least some humanity, even if customer service demanded they shed it. But it was the kind of job I wanted. I wasn't expecting a reply. It's not out of the ordinary when I don't get replies. Most jobs ignore me. I've applied for the local music store multiple times, and according to my online application, it's still pending. It's been pending for two years. So, I wasn't hopeful. It was more likely that independent coffee shop would take me on. Still, I waited for several weeks, with the application at the back of my mind. I still watched the barista vlogs because it was something relaxing to sit back to after class, and when I was stressing over finals. I got a call maybe a week ago in the middle of class. Normally, it's my mom, so I have to mute it. I didn't recognize the number, but I found myself excusing myself from the lecture. The woman on the other end of the line had a voice like nails on a chalkboard. She seemed way too happy about calling me, like she'd been waiting all day. It was jarring. Hello there. Am I correct in saying I'm speaking to Miss Satori? Yes, I said groggily, suddenly forgetting how to speak English, as well as basic etiquette on a business call. I found myself falling asleep in the middle of my lecture. I tend to do that a lot. Sure, my lectures are interesting, but the room is cozy. Uh, the ambience of students typing and my professor's smooth voice like honey trickling in my ears. I shook my head of mind fog and pasted on a smile that I knew she couldn't see. Uh, yes, speaking. Hello, Miss Satori. I apologize for the delay in getting back to you. 
My name is Anna. I'm the assistant manager at Starbucks. We'd love your application, and we think you'd be a great addition to our team. Would you be able to attend an interview at around five? She laughed lightly. Again, I apologize for getting back to you so late. We've had a lot of applications to get through, and yours certainly caught my eye. You're a student, right? I have to say, Miss Satori, with your current qualifications I have in front of me, we think you would be perfect. Qualifications? I had to mentally go over my resume. I left school with a 3.9 GPA and had worked in my local Sephora in my hometown before college. I opened my mouth to correct her, but hey, I wasn't going to turn away an opportunity to work as a barista. Yes, I said again, and as words were going in one ear and out the other, all I was able to say was yes and nod. My cheeks felt like they were going to burn off. She was speaking so fast I could barely understand what she was saying. I had to talk over her. Um, yes. I'm currently in my senior year. I have class four times a week. I wasn't sure what I was saying and why I was saying it. The words were streaming out of me before I could stop myself. I know my roommate lied about her grades to get a job in social media marketing. They wanted straight A's and she didn't even pass math. Still, though, they never checked. Mom always told me employers never do. Anna, however, didn't seem to care. It sounded like she was reaching for anything that I was apparently good at, instead of just admitting I was the ideal candidate because I was a broke college student with barely any social life and free nights. They really were exploiting kids, huh? Well, we can work around that. Anna seemed to say everything with expletives. Is five okay? Uh, today? Yes, today would be preferable. We're quiet around five, so that's when we conduct our interviews. Oh, right. I felt stupid. Yeah, five is fine. I paused, my heart jackhammering in my chest. Do I need any experience? Anna laughed. Well, what do you think training is for? Miss Satori, experience is, of course, preferred like in every job. However, we put our employees through an induction course where they learn all they need to know. I can assure you, no first-hand experience is required. She let out a sigh. I have to say that a lot. You have no idea. Uh, oh. I perked up a little. Uh, I'll be there after class ends. Uh, do I need to bring anything? Anna chuckled. Your brain is all we need. She said. And some common sense, of course. But no, we don't require extensive paperwork. However, we would appreciate a physical copy of your resume and your ID. I, I can bring them. That's no problem, I said. I felt like jumping up and down. A job, an actual paid job as a barista, and I'd be fully trained. The store was maybe a ten-minute walk away from my apartment. It was perfect. Great. Well, I'll see you there. Anna said, and I couldn't keep the grin off my face. She ended the call before I could respond, but I didn't care. All the way through class, I couldn't stop thinking about the interview. A million questions were buzzing around my brain. Would the interview be with Anna or someone else? What if I got choked up and messed up? Anna had explicitly said I didn't need experience, but then I was overthinking everything she had said. It was polite not to ask for it, right? So what if they did need it, and Anna expected me to know that? What if she wanted me to make a double espresso latte with ten types of sauce and whipped cream right in front of her? By the end of class, I was sweating, and my gut was twisting with nausea. I kept picking up my phone and then dropping it in my lap, over and over again. I wanted to ring Anna and tell her I'd made a mistake, but that was just anxiety taking hold. To soothe my mind, I grabbed a coffee from the campus store and took slow sips. A triple venti, half-sweet, non-fat caramel macchiato was my go-to when I was stressed, but that day it was too sweet, too sickly. I couldn't enjoy it without worrying about how it was made. On the way out of my last class of the day, I checked my phone. 4.45. I had 15 minutes to go to the bathroom and make myself at least look presentable, and then head off to the interview. By making myself look presentable, I mean comb through my hair with my fingers and put it in a high pony and wash my face. I wasn't an avid believer in astrology, but I was convinced the stars were practically screaming that I was going to tank my interview. 
When I walked through the door, I was assaulted with the familiar aroma of crushed coffee beans and brownies. It was the kind of smell I was used to, and I immediately relaxed. Anna greeted me at the counter. She was right. The store was pretty dead. I could only glimpse dead-eyed college kids and businessmen typing on their MacBooks. There were four interviewees. The other three looked to be my age and seemed nice enough. Two guys and a girl. The girl had pretty nice hair, I remember thinking. It fell in blonde waves in front of her face. She was way too pretty to be a barista. The guys were like no other guys I'd met before. I only knew the frat kinds that ended up in my roommate's bed every morning. These guys, though, were different. Like they'd just stepped out of a Dungeons and Dragons convention. One of them had red hair sprouting from a baseball cap and had a strong British accent. The other didn't say a word and hid under a bright yellow hoodie which hung off a slimmer frame. Welcome. Anna was maybe my mom's age, with dark hair pulled into a ponytail and a permanent smile that seems to be glued to her face. She was exactly the kind of person I'd pictured on the phone call. You're all here for the barista position. Anna pointed at us individually, counting us. Ah, all of you made it. That's a relief. None of us spoke. I guess we had made a silent mutual agreement to only communicate through nods and hums though Anna didn't seem to mind. Great. Why don't you follow me to the back and we can get started? Um, excuse me? The blonde raised her hand like she was in class. Are the interviews separate? Yeah. The British guy nodded, playing with a loose curl of his hair. Is this a group thing? Anna shook her head. Oh, I thought it was obvious from the way I told each of you on the phone. You all have the job. Uh, there was no interview process. I just need you guys to take a little test, and then we'll be watching a training video as part of the introduction. She folded her arms. Is that okay with you four? It won't take long. The guy with the hoodie lifted his head, confusion crinkling his expression. Wait, so we're all hired? He said something else, the latter of his words enveloped by a screeching sound of beans being grounded in the blender. I tried not to cover my ears, but it was loud. I felt it like knives sticking directly into my skull. Anna was still talking, though I had to step closer to her to fully understand what she was saying. Yes. Now, if you follow me, we're going to go someplace quieter. She eyed the blender and the guy behind it. He looked several years older than the four of us, maybe his late twenties. He seemed unfazed by the noise, dancing with his torso to some pop song on the radio. Rich. Annie's voice broke through the machine's seemingly endless wail. Can you turn that off? The man, or Rich, seemed to snap out of it and nodded, switching off the blender. I caught his eye for a moment, and he held it. I'm not sure why. It was awkward, so I looked away, but I still felt his eyes on me. He didn't speak only shutting off the blender and turning to serve a customer. Thank you. Anna rolled her eyes. Please excuse Rich. He's a lovely guy, and not the smartest, however. She gestured behind the counter, and we followed her through a pair of swinging doors. We were led onto a narrow corridor, with stains and cracks and bruised yellow walls. Not exactly the most hygienic place. Anna took us into the first room. It looked to be her office. There were already four chairs positioned behind a messy desk full of paper and old Starbrook's cups. I noticed a binder hanging off the edge. There was something printed on the front of it that looked uh, familiar. I'd seen it before. It was a logo of some sorts, but I couldn't remember where I'd seen it from. Before I could look any further, Anna placed a stray cup over it. She took a seat behind an expensive-looking laptop, which was idle. If you would like to sit down, I'll be with you in a moment. Anna started typing on her computer, grabbing paperwork and sorting them into a pile next to her. I grabbed a seat and watched her. I figured the mess of paperwork was our resumes. The four of us sat in comfortable silence for a moment while Anna typed vigorously on her laptop. When my palms were starting to go sweaty in my lap, she finally lifted her head. All right, so there's something I'd like you guys to fill out first. It's just a small test, so I can get to know you a little more. 
She stood up and grabbed a handful of paper before depositing a sheet to each of us. Then she gave us a pen. The blonde looked up. So, we just fill these in? Yep. Oh, uh, just wait a second. Anna disappeared out of the door for a moment, and the four of us exchanged looks. The others looked like they were going to laugh. It seemed absurd that we were being tested like we were back at school. I was so used to using a laptop and typing, I struggled to remember if I was right or left-handed. Anna came back in a rush, her cheeks pink. She was holding four cups of coffee, depositing them in front of us. When I picked mine up, it was a simple black coffee. Anna told us we had ten minutes to complete the test before wandering out of the room. Outside, I noticed it had started to get dark. The sky was awash with pretty oranges and yellows. I took a sip from the cup and burnt my tongue. It tasted good. It was the type of coffee I worshipped when I stayed up all night to write an essay. There was a tang to it, and I wondered what it was. Maybe a syrup or added espresso. Pushing mostly stray thoughts to the back of my mind, I focused on the first question. The scratching sound of pen on paper filled the room, and I hurried to follow behind the other three. The front was weird, I noticed. I didn't think I recognized it. It reminded me of a doctor's scrawl. Question one. What is your name? Simple enough, I thought. I wrote about Maki Saturi. My handwriting wasn't the best, but I figured that didn't matter. Question two. What is your age? Reading the text was hurting my eyes. Squinting, I scribbled 22. Question three confused me. It was a math question. Not an easy one, either. I wasn't great at math, so I was automatically struggling. With the pressure of trying to figure out some complicated problem combined with the text, my head was starting to hurt. After a while of trying to count on my fingers, failing to count in my head, and risking a glance at the blonde's paper, I wrote my best guess, which I knew was wrong. I knew it was wrong because it was a random number. Come on, I thought. It's not like the math problem mattered. Exhaling out of breath, I moved on to the next question. Question four. Read this paragraph very carefully. Read this paragraph very carefully. Do you suffer from sleep deprivation? Repeated over eight times. A, yes. B, no. My eyes felt heavy, a dull fog settling over my mind. It kept going halfway down the page. I couldn't stop reading it, like the words were leading my eyes further down. No, I didn't, I thought. But the more I read, the more I started to wonder if I did. I did stay up most nights because of my assignments. I circled, yes. Question 5. Are you alone right now? Yes, no. My pen started to shake in my hands. I knew I wasn't but it was clear the test was trying to mess with my head. It wanted out-of-the-box answers. After hesitating, I circled, yes. Question six. Are you sure? Yes. No. When I glanced up, my stomach twisted. I could see the girl's head bobbing up and down, one of the guys chewing his pen, but I still felt like what I was seeing was wrong. Slowly, I scribbled out my first answer, Encircled, no. Question seven. There are five of you in this room right now. Who, out of the following, does not exist? I dropped my pen, but something came over me. A sensation taking over my hands. I grabbed it quickly. My gaze is skimming over the multiple choice answers. I wanted to leave, to throw my paper down and get the hell out of there. But something came over me. My hold on the pen tightened. I couldn't let go of it. A. Ben. B. Sam. C. Luna. D. Jack. E. Me. I don't exist. When I risked a look up, I saw three faces. I knew there were three faces. I'd learned their names before we'd all walked in. I'd shared a cigarette with Sam in the rain. I laughed at Luna's anecdote about her own protective mother and smiled at Ben while he'd offered a shy wave. 
So why couldn't I remember? I remembered walking in the door. I remember Anna's bright smile, rich, behind the coffee machine, shooting me a scowl. So why couldn't I remember them? The test wanted an answer, so I hesitantly circled Jack. Question 8. Are you enjoying this test? A. Yes. B. Yes. C. Yes. Swallowing something rancid crawling up my throat, I circled yes. The others weren't reacting to the test, and I couldn't help but wonder why. It was some kind of trick, surely, but none of them were speaking. When I glanced up, they were embroiled in their own papers. My head was starting to pound, the taste of coffee still lingering on my tongue, making me nauseous. Outside, it was pitch black. When I looked around for a clock, there was none, though I could have sworn there had been one above Anna's desk. I'd seen it because I remember being surprised that it was almost quarter to seven. I arrived at five. My head started to spin. Had we really spent an hour greeting Anna? How had I lost a whole hour and not even realized it? And why was I only noticing this now? Blinking rapidly, I moved on to the next question. Question 9. How long did it take you to realize Jack does not exist? A. You have always known. B. You only just realized. I circled B. The next question stood out among all the rest. It was in block capitals. Question 10. Find the red square. There were no answers. No multiple choice options. After a disorienting second of staring at my paper like an idiot, I scanned the page and then turned it over, searching for any red squares. There weren't any. I was flipping my paper over, squinting, trying to see if they were hidden in the text or they could only be seen when you really concentrate, when Anna breezed back through the door. All right, pens down, she ordered. I didn't even get to recheck my answers before she was tearing the paper from my hands. Again, I expected the others to say something, like the kind of thing that was burning in the back of my mouth. What the hell? I wanted to say. I wanted to stand up and walk out of there. But the way Anna positioned herself in front of us made me realize she wasn't finished. I felt for my phone to get a proper look at the time, but it wasn't in my pocket. I started to inwardly panic, and then I remembered. Oh, yeah, that fog was back, encasing my mind in cotton candy. I'd left it in my bag, which was in the storage room. How could I forget? I was so, so clumsy sometimes. How did you find the test? Anna asked, her eyes piercing each of us. The blonde, Luna, stood up with a shaky smile. Do you mind if I get going? Her voice was panicked. I don't think this is the job for me. Anna nodded, still with that bright smile. Of course, Luna, after the training video. But I don't want the job, she whispered. Could I please go? Yes, after the training video. Now follow me. Anna said, her tone growing stern. I waited for Luna to give up and walk out, but she didn't. She nodded slowly, her cheeks paling. It was almost like the four of them were trapped under a spell. We couldn't move. We couldn't question authority. When alarm bells started ringing in our heads, they were quickly silenced. I stood up, too, my body tipping to the left and then the right. The clock was back. 11.35. The time struck me as wrong. No, it, it couldn't be eleven. We had only been in the office for twenty minutes. I opened my mouth to say this, but Anna was already ushering us to the door and back down the hallway. But we weren't going back to the storefront. We were going deeper. The corridor felt like it was going on forever, and time, time seemed to slow down. I couldn't see an ending to the corridor, but the closer I got to it, it got farther away, like it was playing with me. When I was staring hard at Anna's back, I could still see the words, Do you suffer from sleep deprivation? Still flickering at the backs of my eyes. When I shook my head, 
I glimpsed something small, something white, bouncing along with the others. A tiny white rabbit. I shook my head again, but no, I wasn't seeing things. The tiny rabbit turned to look directly at me with beady eyes and lifted a small white paw. It was gesturing for me to keep going, bouncing between the boy's legs. So I did. I kept going, until the corridor ended on a simple wooden door. When Anna told us to go inside, I stopped at the threshold. Just looking at the room sent slithers of panic down my spine. But something pushed me forward, despite my body refusing to follow. The room reminded me of an old classroom. The walls were scratched white, and there were four desks. That was it. Four walls and four desks. The others were hesitant, walking in, and I followed, keeping an eye on the door. The rabbit had disappeared. Anna stood at the front, still smiling like she knew something we didn't. Sit down, please. She nodded at the desks. Any desk will do. Is this another test? Luna acted like the desk was teeming with spiders when she took an uncertain seat. Anna shook her head. No, this is the last stage of your induction. When I slumped down at a desk, the boys falling suit, the door opened, and I recognized the guy who had been grinding coffee beans. Rich. He wheeled an ancient-looking TV set inside the room, positioning it in front of us. I felt like I was back at school, back in middle school when the teacher would let us watch Bill Nye the Science Guy. I'd always found the introduction kind of hypnotizing. The room suddenly went dark, and the TV flickered onto a dark blue screen. Rich left, and Anna leaned against the door with her arms folded across her chest. Again, I wanted to speak. I think we all did. But the words wouldn't form coherently in my mind. The television flickered again, like an old VCR, before text appeared in bright white. Silver Screen Home Video System, Praj Blue. Introductory Training. Test 1. Intro. Test 2. Mirror. Test 3. Lullaby. I waited for something to happen. For a moment, there was nothing, before the top option blinked like it was being selected. After a second, the screen erupted into static, before a video started. It reminded me of those old-style VCRs my parents still had at home. I could tell it was damaged, or it had been used too many times because it kept skipping, colors mixing into one confusing hue. I'd seen some training videos from McDonald's on YouTube, and it was similar to that. Music started. It was upbeat and playful. A woman popped up out of nowhere with a wide smile. She looked to be in the background of a Starbucks. There were people in the background making coffee and loud laughter and chat. The presenter looked directly into the camera. You've just landed your dream job with us, she said loudly, never losing that smile. So, what next? Well, we have to train you up, of course. The screen flashed to three teenagers in 70s wear. The woman's voice continued while the camera panned on each one. We're going to show you the do's. It cut to the woman nodding with a smile. And don'ts. Her grin twisted into a frown. Of working at your favorite coffee chain. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Sarah is going to show you guys everything you need to know. The screen cut to a kid washing their hands vigorously, and Comic Sans' text popped up above her head. Let's talk about hygiene, the presenter said. Now, you're going to wash your hands three times, okay? And then put on your apron, just like Sarah. The camera pans to the girl doing exactly what the presenter was saying. I watched Sarah be led through several steps which included checking stocks, making sure surfaces were clean, before she finally put a plastic cup on the counter. The woman appeared again, this time slightly off screen, and the screen collapsed into static. The video was still going on, and I could hear the presenter's voice but there was something overlaying the garbled static. At first, I thought I was seeing things, before the screen turned bright white. It was so bright. I wanted to look away. I wanted to cry out, but I couldn't. There was text in front of me. 
those same words on my test in block capitals practically screaming at me. Find the red squares. But there, there weren't any. I couldn't find any. The video jumped back into frame. Sarah was making a mocha, and the presenter was standing behind her. While I was watching the demonstration, that same message played again, over and over in my mind. Find the red squares. Find the red squares. I was looking for them, forcing my way through the footage, through the static. I was half aware of Anna in front of me. I felt her breath on my cheeks. I felt her cold hands forcing my wrists to the armrest and pinning them down with something. Velcro. I couldn't cry out. My eyes were glued to the screen. When I tried to shut them, Anna's ice-cold fingers were prying them open. Something replaced her fingers. Tape. Tiny pieces of tape held my eyelids open. I managed to move my lips, but all I could manage was a soft moan. I had no choice. I had to watch. I had to find the squares. I had to find the squares. The screen flickered from red to orange. Then the Starbrooks presenter was back, making something. A mocha, I thought. Yes, a mocha. Her eyes flickered to the camera. Okay, so what we're going to do to make the perfect mocha is... She started to explain, and I found myself mouthing her words. They came so easily to me, pouring from my lips, but with no sound. I noticed something in the corner of my eye. Something was pushing at the top of the screen. A red square. When my eyes found it, the square moved to the middle. Then it was at the bottom left-hand corner. I followed it eagerly. The faster it was, my eye movements tracked it perfectly. When the presenter had finished the drink and was holding it up in the air, I was tracking twelve different squares flashing from corner to corner, left to right. Okay then, test one. The presenter's voice dulled in my mind. It sounded less enthusiastic and over the top. No, it was a voice telling me what to do. It was giving me... It was giving me an order. Come on, guys. I just showed you. The woman was laughing, her grin growing bigger and bigger. Step one, I found myself saying, the others echoing. Wash your hands. Very good. The woman on screen smiled like she could hear us. And what is step two? The red squares were back, but they were bigger, growing bigger and bigger. Step two, we said. We grind the beans in the blender. That's right, the woman said. And what if your establishment does not have a blender? We use a rolling pin, we said back. The woman nodded. You're doing so well, guys. Why don't you give yourself a pat on the back? I strained to move my hands to do it, but I couldn't move. The woman's smile grew. There you go. Step three. Come on, say it with me. And remember, service with a smile. I don't want to see any frowns. The red squares were growing bigger. I felt my lips widening into a grin that hurt my jaw. The presenter's image wavered, and she looked almost 3D, like she was coming out of the TV. Step three. Our voices fell in sync with hers. And I couldn't control myself. I couldn't control my body. I couldn't control my smile that was quickly becoming a demented grin. We start whipping the cream and clearing the surfaces of any unused ingredients. The red squares were flashing in every corner now. I caught each one and every question the woman asked me. I answered. When the screen flashed to another bright red screen with the words, Please stand by, I felt my left eye strain. Whatever was holding it open was struggling. And then... Something snapped. The tape, or whatever it was, came loose. My left eye was free. And once it was, that something was screaming, piercing my ears. I felt it rooted inside of me, something alive. Something crawling directly into my skull. With my eyes free, I blinked. Then I blinked again. The training video seemed to snap out of existence, replaced by a white screen. The following footage is top secret. Unauthorized viewing of the following is punishable by 06-356-GM6. 
See protocol. If a subject resists, please refer to protocol H912. Neutralization. Please stand by. But the others were still talking, I realized. I could hear them reciting another coffee recipe in a symphony drone. Whatever the training video was, it wasn't playing for Anna. Only for us. Only for me, when my eyes were completely open. It didn't take Anna long to notice. The dull fog that had been choking my brain for hours was starting to lift. All those thoughts that had been forced back were drifting back into the forefront of my mind. I managed to tear one wrist free, but Anna was in front of me before I could try anything else. I remember crying out. I remember begging her. But she didn't listen. Her smile was gone. I didn't see a woman in charge of a coffee chain. I saw someone else. Someone a lot higher up. When my eyes were held open once again, my panicked gaze found the screen, which once again flickered back to the training video. The presenter and Sarah were back in front of the camera, like they were waiting for me. The presenter was shaking her head with a frown. Uh-oh, she said. Looks like someone's lagging behind. Let's try this again, shall we? Yes. The others droned on. Let's try this again. If you're wondering what happened after that, I have no idea. I remember going back to my apartment. I fell asleep and woke up three days later. My roommate thought I was dead. But worse still, I kept blacking out at random times of the day. I'll be at home on my laptop, and then I'm sitting in my kitchen talking to my roommate with no memory of the conversation. When I asked her what was going on, she seemed confused. This morning, I woke up, standing in the back rooms of Starbrooks. Sam, Luna, and Ben were with me. Anna was talking to us, but I don't remember what she was saying. There were two men in black standing either side of her. I think they were armed, though I can't be sure. I don't know if this is even real. I don't know if my mind is playing tricks on me. I keep blacking out and waking up somewhere completely different. I've had this recurring nightmare that I'm strapped down. The room is dim, and there is no light. The only light is the one looming over me. It's so bright, it hurts my eyes. Something sharp is pointed directly at my face. There are people in white dotted around me. They wear masks and stare at me with quizzical eyes that don't blink. Every nightmare I have, the needle gets closer. My roommate thinks I need to go and see a doctor. I told her the Starbrooks video did something to me, but she thinks I'm playing around. I just know I'm not the same. I don't sleep. I barely eat. I can't remember the last time I went to class. I don't work at Starbrooks, and yet I'm always there. I'm always there standing in front of Anna, but her words never make sense when I try to go over them in my head. I just know that I have to do something. I have to do something important. I know something for sure. Whatever I'm doing, I don't think I'm making coffee. Ten, nine, eight, seven, seven, seven. There's, there's something in my head. I think I've done a bad thing. Tell me I haven't done a bad thing. I keep losing time. Ten hours. It's always ten hours. What I lost comes back to me in nightmares that I can't decipher. I'm strapped to a bed. I can't move. I can't scream. There's something sharp. The point of a needle getting closer and closer to me. It's been nearly two weeks since my interview at Starbrook's Coffee. And I'm sure the video I was made to watch as part of my induction did something to me. It's done something to my head. That's why I'm losing time. Why I feel like I'm losing myself. Whatever happens to me and the other interviewees at the back of Starbrook's Coffee, it's rooted itself into the back of my head. I'm counting, all the time. I wake up, counting. I fall asleep, counting. And I don't know why. I don't know why, because most of my day has been torn from me, and I'm left with fragments I'm trying to piece together, like a jigsaw puzzle. I'm sorry if that makes no sense, 
I can barely decipher my own memories, and what I have managed to salvage is coming out more like incoherent babbling. I'm trying to write as calmly as I can, but I don't have much time. I don't know how much time I have, because I should be doing something right now. I should be somewhere else, not here. The voices in my head, the ones that hurt me, the ones that tell me to count back from ten, they're pulling on my thoughts. They're in my head. They're in my head. I've lived out seven days since I initially posted here, and I can barely remember any of them. I can remember small things like eating breakfast with my roommates and grabbing milk from the store. I can remember phone calls with my mother, but the rest of it, gone. I don't remember going to class. I don't remember going to work, but I must be because there's always an empty Starbucks cup on my bedside. Like a reminder. My name scrawled on the front in black marker pen. It's my handwriting. Always a triple venti, half-sweet, non-fat caramel macchiato. I don't remember writing it. I don't remember a lot of things, and it's starting to drive me crazy. My life is being sucked down a hole, and I can't get it back. Whatever I'm doing, though, I know it has something to do with Starbrooks. It has something to do with Anna and the video she had forced me to watch. Yesterday, I awoke, counting, to that same noise, the one that ripped into my brain when the grinning woman on the video had been crawling inside my head, seeping into my thought process and slowly taking control. I was on the floor, curled into myself, my body aching like I'd willingly thrown myself through a meat grinder. It took me several seconds to fully come to. I was on my back in the same clothes from the day before. They felt filthy, sticky to my palmy flesh. I stared at the ceiling for a moment, trying to get control of my own mind, at my own lips. But I was still mouthing numbers. Ten. I squeezed my eyes shut and tried to think of something else. Anything else. But the countdown was cemented in my brain. Nine. When I tried to force my lips into my control, the opening of a song I liked, a, a poem I'd written in my sophomore year of high school, the numbers took over. Eight. I shook my head. Seven. I waited for six, but six never came. Instead, my lips kept going in flux, mouthing the same number. Seven. 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 When I sat up, dazedly blinking through morning sunlight, I glimpsed something on my bed. A tiny camera. Next to it was a USB cable and my laptop sitting idle. The last thing I could fully recall was helping my roommate drag in a sofa she'd bought off of Craigslist. But even that was blurry. My bedroom was dark. The bedside lamp I normally kept on all night was off. My jacket was flung on the bed next to the laptop, and, bizarrely, my phone was on the other side of the room. Leaving my phone to charge, I set up the camera. It was brand new, but I had no memory of buying it. When the device pinged on my laptop, I double-clicked, and whatever footage I'd managed to record popped up, what looked like the reflection of an eye shrouded in darkness. I was about to press play when my bedroom door flung open, my roommate, Cass, poking her head through. She looked half asleep, blinking through dark hair hanging in her eyes. Aren't you supposed to be at work? Cass's voice was a soft croak through a yawn. Her gaze fell on the laptop and the camera in my lap. What are you doing? I shut the laptop. Work? My gaze went to the empty Starbucks cup sitting on my bedside table. A job, I thought. I had a job. I had a job I couldn't remember going to. The last time I remembered stepping foot in the coffee shop was the night of my induction. After that, I slept for three days. Though I was starting to wonder if I'd really been sleeping. I was living a whole other life without even knowing. Maybe I was crazy, I thought dizzily. My aunt had a brain tumor. What if that was what it was? I could vaguely remember being sixteen and googling the symptoms, pulling up a WebMD page. Memory loss, confusion, headaches. I wasn't sure about hallucinations, but could that really be it? I thought. Had everything I'd seen been some mismatched delusion? Yeah, work, Cass said, snapping me out of it. 
Considering how obsessed you are with this new job, I figured you'd have gone by now. I'm not obsessed? She scoffed. Uh-huh. I personally believe you've been brainwashed. It's the only logical explanation. That was ironic. Cass cleared her throat when I didn't answer. Hey, Earth to Mackie. Are you okay? Yeah, I lied. What time is it? She shrugged. Half past eight. You were supposed to be at work like half an hour ago. Cass cocked her brow. Funny, you don't seem to care this morning. Which is weird since you practically live there with all your new friends. I ran my fingers through my hair. It felt like straw. Live there? Yeah. Rolling her eyes, my roommate scowled. You're barely at home, Mackie. Didn't you get back late? Aren't you tired? I had to think about that. Was I tired? I felt terrible, sure. My head was pounding and my body ached. But I wasn't tired. Before I could answer her, Cass shot me a smile. Just promise me, okay? Don't dump college for a barista job. It might seem fun right now, but you need to think long term. It's something to think about. Cass? She cut me off, disappearing back down the hall. You're gonna get fired if you don't move. Shuffling off my bed, I stretched. My mouth was dry, like I hadn't drank in hours. Can you make me coffee? I'm half naked. Came her squeaky reply. It's not like I wanted to go to work, but I did want to know what was going on. I wanted to know why hours of my life were being sucked away, and I was left with splintering pieces, pieces that didn't matter. The nightmares bled back into the forefront of my mind, starching white walls and a ceiling, intense golden light blinding me, gloved fingers curling around a scalpel which was inching closer and closer to me. They didn't feel like the night terrors I had as a kid, the ones I could brush away. These ones felt real, like they had happened. My Starbrook's induction was still playing in my head. The test with mind-bending questions that messed with my psyche, and the coffee I was sure Anna had drugged to lower my inhibitions. Whatever she subjected me to was causing my blackouts, but what exactly had the video done to me? The question enveloped my thoughts while I showered quickly, changed into fresh clothes, and grabbed my bag. I was stepping out of my apartment, a dry piece of toast hanging out of my mouth, my hands in my hair trying to tie a decent pony, when a figure loomed into view. The guy was leaning against a door frame, no longer in a bright yellow hoodie. He wore a fitted jacket over a shirt and jeans, a pair of Ray-Bans slicked dark brown hair back. Finally, he said in a breath. His expression was bright, but I noticed dark shadows under his eyes. His cheeks had a paled look to them, like they were drained of color. We started to work like an hour ago. I was speechless for a moment. It was one of the other interviewees. You're... I dug for a name, but my mind was blank. The guy's lips curved slightly. Sam, he said. You've forgotten my name already, huh? Ouch. No. I started to walk, quickening my pace. Sorry. Brain blank. He shrugged, sticking to my side. Happens to the best of us. I knew him. That's what my mind was telling me, at least. I'd been working with him for a week. When I racked my brain, however, there was nothing. Even when part of me knew of laughing with him about TV shows none of us watched, kicking through fall leaves on the way to work, and awkwardly asking him to fix the coffee machine for me. So many memories, and... None of them felt right. How do you know where I live? The words were spewing out my mouth before I could stop them. I took quick steps down the apartment block stairs, eager to lose him. I expected my sour tone to scare him off, but Sam was right behind me. Uh, we walk to work together? He said, when I pushed open the swinging doors leading outside. The street was alive with the morning rush hour and I was grateful for it. Sam followed me, and I pushed through a group of school kids. He was practically breathing down my neck. Also, 
You're late. Our boss is having an aneurysm. You mean Anna? I said breathlessly, and he responded with a scoff. The cool breeze was a relief on my cheeks, blowing my hair from my eyes. When I crossed the road, I glimpsed something in the corner of my eye. At first, I thought it was a dog, but it was too small. When I got closer, fastening my pace, I realized I was seeing a rabbit. A small, white rabbit in the middle of the sidewalk. I blinked rapidly, but it was still there. It was the rabbit I'd seen after I'd taken the test at the job induction. Sam was talking, I realized, but his voice had collapsed into white noise. He was talking about work, something about a ring getting stuck in the trash disposal and an argument with Rich. I couldn't concentrate on his words. All I could see was the rabbit. It looked so out of place. A piece of my own personal nightmare sitting on a mundane street of grey on a weekday morning. I had to know if I was losing my mind. When I edged forward, the rabbit turned and started to bounce across cracks in the walk, hopping between people's legs. It wasn't real, I told myself. Except, it was. It was real. I was staring at it, and it wasn't weaving or blurring out of view. Before I could hesitate, I was catapulting into a run. I was aware of Sam yelling my name, but my attention was on the rabbit. I couldn't stop myself, like my body had a mind of its own. I was counting again, my lips mouthing each number. The pain in my head was back, cruel, slicing into the back of my skull. It felt like something was there, protruding into my brain. Ten. I threw myself into a sprint. Nine. The rabbit didn't move for a second, seemingly waiting for me to get close enough for my fingers to graze the back of its fur. Eight. Tearing down the walk, bumping shoulders with people whose responses were like gibberish. I could hear them, but I also couldn't. They were like Sam, incoherent. Seven. Seven. My lips burned with the number like it was poison on my tongue. Seven. I remember thinking. Why couldn't I get past seven? Watch out! A voice was yelling, but I couldn't concentrate on it. I couldn't concentrate on anything but the number seven and the rabbit in my reach. I was so close. A dull fog settled over my vision. My head started to spin like I was going round and round on a carousel. I was back in the white room with the TV in front of me. The presenter was on screen, her smile stretched across her face. Very good. Her screech was rooted inside my head. Now, how do we make a mocha again? I could hear myself reply, my voice an emotionless drawl sympathizing with the others. The memory took me off guard and I almost went flying, though seeing more would have been torn from me only gave me more incentive to catch the rabbit. They had messed with my head, I thought. They drugged me and then messed with my head, making me see rabbits, making me question my sanity. I pumped my arms faster and had my hands stretched out to scoop it up when something flew past me, tearing the breath from my lungs. The air seems to turn boiling hot, fumes hitting me in the face, warm fingers wrapping themselves around my wrist in a tight hold and yanking me back. Reality contorted back into focus. I was standing in front of a main road, cars flying past me. Commuters were frowning at me like I was crazy. I just chased after an imaginary rabbit in broad daylight. I was crazy. Sam was bent over, gasping for breath, his hands on his knees. Okay, whatever you're smoking, hand it over. I shook my head, my cheeks burning. Did you see that? Was all I could choke out. See what? He straightened up. You mean your attempts to isekai yourself? Yeah, I did. There was... I trailed off, looking for the rabbit, but I was just looking at the empty air. What? Sam spluttered. What did you see? Instead of answering him, I stayed silent. Maybe what was best. I wouldn't say it was a comfortable silence, because Sam kept whistling in odd intervals before stopping abruptly. It was jarring, the way he whistled, like each melody meant something. A youngish woman walked by, pushing a stroller, but when I looked closer, it was empty. 
There was a blanket and toys, but no baby. Swallowing something warm, climbing back up my throat, I focused on Sam. He looked to be deep in thought, his gaze flickering to each passerby in quick succession. I noticed he looked nothing like the guy I'd met on the night of our induction. He had hid under a yellow hoodie and didn't want to be seen. This guy seemed to full-body scan every person that passed him with a simple glance. Sam? Saying his name felt a mixture of wrong and right, like I knew him, but at the same time I didn't. I wanted to know, then. I wanted to know if Sam was seeing the same things as me. If he was going crazy, too. His gaze snapped to me. Yeah. Are you blacking out? That's a weird question to ask after jumping in front of a truck. Are you? I pressed. Sam shrugged, kicking through a pile of fall leaves scattering the sidewalk. Not that I know of, he murmured, shoving his hands in his pockets. I pass out at work sometimes, but that's the night shift. It messes with my head. There isn't a night shift, I said. I knew that because I'd been on a late-night coffee run during finals. The place was closed. I'd even knocked on the door. So, if the store was closed... What the hell was I doing all night? Sam shot me a look and dug in his jacket for a pack of cigarettes and pulled one out, lighting it up. For new employees, they're extending the opening hours, Mackie. It's for our training. Anna told us like a thousand times. Nodding slowly, I followed his words. Right. So, we work all night. Yeah. He took a drag. Seriously. What's going on? I'm fine, I said dismissively. Do you remember the night of our interview? Sure. We watched that training video. And the test? I added. Sam looked confused for a moment before nodding. Oh yeah, that weird test? Yeah. Freaky stuff. Right? I hissed. So... What I'm saying is, what if the test and the training video did something? Like, emotionally drain us? Sam chuckled through another drag. I lowered my voice. No. I mean actually doing something to us. Like, controlling us. Sam laughed. Not a quiet laugh. A proper laugh, throwing his head back, his Ray-Bans slipping over his eyes. He pushed them back up. Oh yeah, absolutely. Anna's a hothead. After several shifts, I'm convinced she wants us to be some kind of supersonic barista force. He sent me a grin. Who needs sleep, right? Not us. No, you don't understand what I'm saying. I gritted out. I'm losing time. I'm losing ten hours every night, and I don't know what I'm doing. I choked out a laugh which died in my throat. You keep telling me I'm working with you, and we're colleagues, but since the night of our induction, I have no memory of working. Sounds like you burn out, Sam shrugged, stepping over cracks in the sidewalk. Burnt out? Yeah, like I said, we've been doing long shifts. Hey, I can relate. I mean, we've been working the night shifts for a week now, and Anna's working us like dogs. So we're all bound to lose ourselves at some point, you know? He shrugged with a smile. Baristas, man. We're humanity's obedient slaves with a meager wage. His ignorance was driving me crazy. How could he be so dismissive? He remembered the test and the training video, so it didn't make sense that he'd seem unfazed by everything we'd been forcibly subjected to. And what about class? I demanded. Huh? Class, you're a student. Sam's expression changed drastically. His eyes prickled with confusion. It almost looked like he was awakening from a trance, like the fog over his eyes was clearing, even if it was just for a moment. Class, he muttered, his tone soft and whimsical. I haven't been in class in a while, actually, which is weird. In fact, I was going to... I was going to do something... His expression twisted, 
like he was trying to remember, but was finding nothing. That's what I'm saying, I whispered. Sam, they did something to us. He shook his head, seemingly snapping back to normal. Nah, we're just tired, Sam nodded, as if reassuring himself. Yeah, we're tired. We're tired. That's why I forgot about, uh, about class. We're tired. His voice reminded me of my own during the training video. I shoved him hard. So you remember what we did last night? I gritted out. You remember the whole night? He hummed. Yeah, it was pretty dead, so Anna taught us how to make frappes. You should know. You spilled one all over yourself and snapped at a customer. His gaze snapped to me. You do remember that, right? I didn't answer him. I couldn't answer him, because I had no idea what the hell he was talking about. When the two of us finally walked through swinging doors into Starbrooks, I found myself overwhelmed by the warm glow in the store. Sam was back to his usual chipper self. It was fairly busy, a queue of around seven or eight people. Sam ushered me behind the counter, and I had no idea what to do, where to go. The other two interviewees were working. The girl with the pretty blonde hair had her back to me, blending fruits on the counter, while the red-headed boy was taking orders at the front. Neither of them spoke to me. Sam flung his jacket in Anna's office and put his apron on before throwing me mine. I felt a sick sense of deja vu being back in her office. The four chairs were still there, though her desk was a lot tidier. All the paperwork from last time was gone, her laptop sitting idle. I found myself staring at it before Sam grabbed my arm gently. Okay, so you can start with orders or Ben will kill you. His laugh was light. You know how much he hates talking to customers in the morning, so he's pretty pissed. Also, I need you to put out prices for the raisin cakes. We don't have any left. Pissed is an understatement, the girl said, her tone sing-song as she reached on her tiptoes to grab a fresh batch of fruit. She moved in sync with the song on the radio, sidestepping to the beat. I found it hard to believe she was so lively and it wasn't even 10 a.m. When I slided past her, she shot me a grin, though it quickly fizzled out. What's up with you? Luna. I remembered her name. This time, her blonde hair was in a neat pony, sticking through her Starbrook's cap. When Sam hurried past carrying a tray of donuts, she nudged him with her elbow. What's up with her? He shrugged. Tired, I guess. He caught my eye. Orders, Mackie. Don't just stand around. So, Sam was a control freak, I quickly came to realize. I nodded dizzily, trying to tie my apron with trembling hands. Sam wandered off who knows where, and I ended up taking orders. It wasn't as hard as I thought. As soon as I had the notebook and pen in my hand and was actively asking people what they wanted, my hands worked on autopilot, like I already knew what to do. A girl around a few years younger than me was next, but she ignored me, her gaze flickering to Ben, who was struggling with the coffee machine. Could I get a raspberry smoothie? The girl slid over five dollars. I'd only known Ben for maybe half an hour, and I could tell he wasn't a morning guy. Luckily, Sam took over the coffee machine problem. Yeah. Ben nodded at the girl and took the cash. See this? Sam mocked the narrator while he tinkered with the machine. Is a Ben in his natural habitat. If you look closely, you'll see he's intentionally ignoring the female's advances. In fact, a Ben has been shown to ignore advances from the male and female. He's baffling scientists everywhere. See? Look. Here's a demonstration. The way the girl was leaning into the counter trying to expose as much cleavage as possible made it inherently obvious what she really wanted. When Ben dumped a smoothie in front of her with way too much force, her lips quivered into a smile. Could I get a straw? She was talking directly to him while Sam and I were right there. Sam nudged me. See? Nothing. Nodding, Ben grabbed a straw and pierced the top. The girl hummed. Could I maybe get a number, too? 
Ben leaned on his fist. Fifty-six, he grumbled, his gaze snapping to a young kid in the queue. Next. The girl's mouth opened slightly, like she was going to say something, before she turned and stalked out. Wow, Sam straightened up. That was brutal. Luna laughed, her back to the three of us while she prepped fruit. It's like he's oblivious. Thanks. Ben rolled his eyes and turned to me with his arms folded. Look who finally decided to show up. He wasn't smiling, but there was a gleam of playfulness in his eyes. I knew it. At least, that's what my brain told me. Ben. Sam worked like a robot, his hands doing seven things at once, somehow. Be nice. I am nice. The redhead rolled his eyes. It's the British accent, Luna chirped. The dead Pantone doesn't help. You're a dead Pantone. Ben ducked his head while the others started laughing, but I could definitely see the ghost of a smirk on his lips. My morning shift went surprisingly well. I knew where everything was, and I could make drinks without even thinking. The wrongness of it all kept coming over. How unnatural it was to suddenly be talented at something I had no memory of doing, but I fell into a daze, enveloping in symphony with the others. It's weird. It's like my brain refused to stop, refused to take a break. When I wasn't doing something, I was looking for something else to do. I made drinks I couldn't even pronounce, and talked with the other three like we'd been friends our whole lives. It was wrong. A tiny voice in my head kept murmuring. Except I was always working with noise, whether that was the screeching of beans being blended or the radio blasting idle hits. I was serving a customer around early evening when I glimpsed that all-too-familiar ball of white behind the window. A woman ordered two espressos, and I made them with shaky hands. Turning back to serve her, I could see the rabbit at the corner of my eye. I looked away to put cash the customer had given me in the register, but when I risked a glance back, it was in the store, just behind two teenage girls. Again, it was out of place, so wrong. The world was going on around me in a blur, and yet all I could see, all I could concentrate on, was the rabbit. It was getting closer every time I looked away or blinked. Leaning forward, I squinted to see if once again I was seeing things. I couldn't be, but nobody else was seeing it. Nobody else was pointing it out. Which meant I really was crazy. I thought I was losing my mind. Mackie? Sam's hands were on my shoulder suddenly. When I twisted around to look at him, he was practically bouncing on the heels of his shoes impatiently. You okay? Customers are waiting. Two coffees. The man wasn't even looking at me. His gaze stuck to his phone. When he did look up, his lips were moving, but I couldn't tell what he was saying. Instead, I was looking for the rabbit. It was inches from the counter, staring up at me with beady eyes. I squeezed my eyes shut and willed it away, but it was still there. The others were working behind me. I was aware of Sam taking over my order and Ben lecturing Luna about something. Except all the sound had been sucked away, leaving my own breaths. I felt my arms fall to my sides. I couldn't breathe. The time, I thought, suddenly. What was the time? I don't know why the words were in my head, scattered like alphabet soup but they pushed their way to the forefront of my mind like they had always been there. I looked for the time. I was used to looking at the clock above the door. When I glanced at it, however, the numbers looked backwards. Warped. Wrong. I stumbled back with a sharp cry and reached for my phone in my pocket. When I looked at the time on my home screen, it was the exact same. Wrong. The numbers were distorted and blurry like I was underwater. I dropped my phone. I knew I dropped it because I felt it slip from my fingers. The world seemed to fall away before my eyes. The ground was torn from beneath me, and I was falling. I wasn't sure where. I could still hear the soft thump of the radio blasting and voices. Except I was somewhere else. I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be. A place far away from my reality. Far away from what I believed in. Wide walls. A silver ceiling. I was moving fast. 
the walls were flying by in a dizzying deluge I couldn't comprehend, and my stomach was diving into my throat. I couldn't move. Something was restricting my arms and legs. There were voices around me, drowning in white noise. When I opened my mouth to cry out, cold hands shoved my head back down. Figures. I glimpsed figures dancing around, silhouettes bleeding into the shadow. I was pushed through doors that looked familiar, and yet I'd never seen them before. Someone was looming over me, another faceless shadow prodding and poking me with sharp fingernails. The shadows spoke, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. Their lips moved, but only gibberish came out. No, 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 get off me, get off me. A panicked cry slipped into my ears. I knew it. When I lifted my head, strained from the Velcro straps pinning down my torso, a guy was dragged past me. I knew from the flash of red curls caught in the dizzying light who it was. It didn't look like him. Not the guy I had just been working with. There was something wrapped around his head and spotted different shades of red. A bandage. Ben was being carried out by two people in white. He was struggling, dragging his kicking feet. His arms were tied behind his back. I couldn't see his face. When I tried to see it, I only saw distortion. I only saw what my brain wanted me to see. I saw his feet, filthy and bloodied, scathing pristine white tiles as he was dragged further and further away. When Ben disappeared through a door at the end of a long winding corridor, I was pushed through another set of doors. The whole place seemed to be just that. Doors. Doors that led into terrifying places illuminated in sickly light. Where's Ben? I said with no sound. I had no voice. The words were tangled on my tongue. I kept asking it or trying to, but I was ignored. This time I saw a face. A real face I could identify. It was a man my dad's age. His eyes were cold and calculating, lips twisting into a scowl. He leaned close and prodded the back of my head. Something was there. I could feel it protruding into me. A sickening crunch sent my stomach into my throat, and my response was to cry. But I couldn't cry. My eyes were dry, my chest was heaving, but where there should have been an emotional response, there wasn't. Pain. There was so much pain, and I couldn't stop it. My body reacted to his touch, spasming, but I couldn't control it. I couldn't control my contorting limbs that were no longer mine. I screamed. I didn't hear my scream, but I felt it burning in my lungs. Something was there. Something was in my head. It felt like a parasite, like a leech crawling into my brain. The man held no sympathy in his eyes, no mercy, nothing. When he raised his hands to signal the others around him, his fingers were slick scarlet. Count back from ten, he ordered. I did. I did when his fingers were in the back of my head once again, twisting. Ten. The number slipped from my lips in a soft sob. Nine. Eight. Seven. 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 On the fourth seven, garbled on my tongue, he plunged his fingers in once again. It's not working, he grunted turning to somebody out of my view. Protocol 2193 was administered successfully. The subject seems to be having trouble following instructions. I'll need to do further testing, which include going deeper than I expected. With him distracted, I could only stare at the ceiling and wish death upon myself. I want to die, I thought dizzily. I want to die. When something sharp stabbed into my head, I felt something warm and wet slide down the back of my neck. I felt it dampening the sheets I was lying on. I started counting. I was counting when a tube was forced into my mouth and something dripped down the back of my throat. At first, it was slow. But then, it was gushing through my lips, choking me, burning me inside out. The same man was there again. Count back from ten for me. His voice was far more gritted and impatient. I tried again. My lips were burning. My chest was burning. My body was burning. I don't remember the countdown. 
What happens next came in rapid flashes, like I was watching an old movie. Time seemed to jump forwards. This time, I was standing in that same classroom in front of a desk. Something warm covered my ears. Sam, Luna, and Ben were next to me. They weren't moving. I saw their feet. I saw toes caked with dirt. I saw Luna's hair hanging in tangled rat tails in front of my face. This time, a group of people stood before us. Hold out your arm. We were ordered. When Sam stepped forward and pulled up his sleeve, I glimpsed a number etched into his skin. I couldn't make it out, no matter how hard I tried. My body was working against me on autopilot. I was ordered to take a step forward, and I did. Something cold pierced my skin, and I stopped thinking for a while. My mind swamped in cotton candy. I half came to sit at a desk once again. The room was dark. The TV set was on, static blurring my vision. Anna was standing over me with a pinched expression. I felt her hands tiptoe across my scalp before retracting. She straightened up with a sigh. Are they ready? The same male grunt sliced into the silence. Anna nodded. Not fully. However, if you really want a demonstration, go ahead. Indeed. The man cleared his throat. The TV flickered to the bright blue screen. Identify yourselves. The words were coming out of my mouth, and I had no control over them. But I wasn't alone. Sam, Luna, and Ben joined in, our voices once again in the symphony. Stand by. Project White Rabbit. Test 3. Phase 2. Very good. Now... Count back from ten. We did. Slowly. Another training video started, this time presented by a man. But it was mute. As the numbers fell effortlessly from my lips, I was tracking red squares once again, my eyes catching each one that hit corner to corner. When we were on the number four, the bulb above exploded, showering the room with glass. I didn't move. I couldn't move. Three. The desk I was sitting on started to rattle, and then the walls were shuddering. An earthquake was my initial thought. But when we reached two, and then one, I realized we were the ones doing it. Turn it off, the man ordered. The TV was switched off, and the room came to a standstill. Murmurs filled the air, speech I couldn't understand. Agent Terran, you said Mirror was a success. I did, Anna said. But there seems to be something interfering with the signal. Let me fix it. The man nodded. The initial stages went better than we expected. White Rabbit is on track to becoming one of our greatest breakthroughs yet. It's still a massive risk, Anna murmured. If we fail, the consequences will be catastrophic. What we're doing will benefit America's children. The man cut her off. Now, allow me. The TV was switched back on. With all due respect, Agent Terran, we will get better results if we use GM-46. While he spoke, my eyes found the TV screen once again while it flickered onto what looked like an old slide presentation, before landing on one that looked strained red, like it had been burned, or attempted to be burned. Underlined at the top, I could just about make out... Protocol GM-46, only to be subjected in extreme cases. Protocol GM-46 should only be used if vocal, psychological, and physical torture has no effect. Please only use as a last resort. Anna shook her head. I saw a motion prick onto her face. Agent Carter, there's no need for that. Yes, there is. If no progress is made, we will be going through with GM-46. Anna's gaze snaps to the bright red screen. But it's... Stand up. Agent Carter ignored Anna and turns to us. And like clockwork, we did. The door opened and four children walked in. Two boys and two girls, maybe seven or eight years old. Each of them carried a white rabbit. Anna's voice shook silently. All moral inhibitions have been removed. 
that the subjects will do whatever we ask of them when we ask it, which is the first stage of mirror. Allow me to demonstrate. She opened her mouth to speak, but Carter stepped in front of her. He gently took the hand of a little girl and strode over to Sam. Subject 626, he ordered. Kill the rabbit. Sam bent and gathered the rabbit in his arms. At first I thought he was hugging it to his chest, but I saw his fingers twine around its neck and jerk suddenly. There was a sickening, snapping noise, and the rabbit dropped to the ground. The little girl who had been holding it lifted her head and stared at Sam with wide eyes. Agent Carter clapped his hands. Well done, he said. Now, kill the child. There was a pause. Sam didn't move. Six to six. I'm waiting. No, Sam said through gritted teeth. His voice was strained. I'm sorry. No, I, I can't. I gave you an order. No, I won't. I won't. Sam's confusion was evident in his cries, and I wanted to press my hands over my ears, but I couldn't move. The world wavered, my vision blurring. I was walking. I could see concrete beneath my feet, cracks in stone and leaves I was kicking through. There was something in my hand. Coffee. Four pairs of footsteps, fall leaves dancing in the air. Our footsteps were in sync, our breaths joined together in the air. The sky was dark blue. Twilight. Luna's laugh startled me. I caught the sight of her swinging ponytail. And then the customer was like, are you kidding me? You don't do it shakes? And I was like, no, you're two years late, maybe even three. And let me guess, she punched you in the face. Ben's voice was a low murmur. No, but she stormed out. Sam's laugh sent ice shooting down my spine. You're lucky it was late and Anna wasn't watching you. She spat at me. I stopped walking, my body going rigid. I don't know the time, the day. For a disorienting moment, I didn't even know where I was. I recognized the strip of stores by Starbucks. We were on break, I thought, the words streaming into my head. Anna let us go on break after we'd worked all night and day. We were getting lunch. It was like my body was working without me. Two worlds. Both of them felt fake. Both of them felt like I was dreaming. I clutched the coffee cup so hard, half of it spilled out. I've gotta go. My voice broke around the words. The three of them turned to look at me, matching expressions, and my stomach twisted. I had to remove myself from the link. Whatever they were, it wasn't me. What? Luna frowned. But I was going to treat you guys. Looking at Luna, at the stranger my brain was telling me was a friend, the breath caught in my throat. I had to tell them. Before I could stop myself, I was grabbing Sam's jacket sleeve and pulling it up. But there was no number. Sam jerked his arm away with a snort. And once again, I'm questioning if you actually have a concussion, Mackie. Concussion? Luna grabbed my hand, her fingers entangling with mine. What happened? I, uh, I'm fine, I said in a sharp breath. I've got to go home. I was moving away from them before I gave up and told them everything. Wait, Sam shouted. Hey, look out for the road this time. I was already stumbling back. There were no rabbits, no blurring vision. It was my reality, the one I knew. And yet, it still felt wrong. Like the white classroom was where I belonged. The crowd felt claustrophobic when I threw myself into a sprint. Footsteps following me back to my apartment. I knew it was them, but they were slow. I could sense them behind me. I locked my door and opened my laptop, but the camera was fried. I was looking at a black screen. Whatever footage I managed to capture without getting caught. Everything I remembered in splintering fragments. Everything I remembered in splintering fragments. It was gone. I didn't do it myself, I thought. 
Or did I? Did I destroy the camera? Without knowing? I don't know how many hours passed. I was still staring at the laptop screen when my phone rang. Three singular beeps. Mom flashed up, and I grabbed it and slammed the phone to my ear. Mom? I sobbed. Mom, something... Count backwards from ten for me. A male voice. I felt my grip on the phone loosen, and I was speaking before I could stop myself. Ten. My phone slipped from my steely grip. Nine. Eight. Seven. The word was stuck in my throat. I felt myself moving, cold air whipping my hair from my face. It was raining, and I was wearing a tank top. It was pitch black. 11 p.m. My feet were bare on wet tarmac, and a voice, soft and soothing, seeping into my skull and taking an unyielding hold. All I remember is the intense green of the Starbrook's logo getting closer and closer, blurring in my eyes. Anna in the doorway, waving me inside. That was fifteen hours ago. My head hurts. My body is aching and on edge. It's like a sensory overload. I jump at every little noise, and my first logical response to the noise is... Attack. My mouth tastes of blood. My hands feel filthy, but they're clean. Too clean. They smell of bleach. I remember nothing. Ten whole hours have gone by. My head is a cavern. My memories cruelly picked apart. There's a whole white rabbit in the corner of my eye. It won't go away. This time, its fur is matted with red, beady eyes, colorless. When I stare hard enough, I see small arms still cradling it to a powder pink t-shirt. I see blonde ringlets hanging in wide eyes. Not Sam is outside. The noises he's making are scaring me. He keeps telling me to open the door. He's whispering into the hole in my head. I think I've done a bad thing. Have I done a bad thing? Please, tell me I haven't done a bad thing. <laughs>